Hi, um, welcome everyone to the final installment of the Alumni Career Pathway Series here at Emily Carr University. Emily Carr is located on the unceded traditional and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, I'm Shannon McKinnon, the Director of Career Development and Work Integrated Learning here at Emily Carr, and tonight's panel is focused on industrial design and will be moderated by al alumni Hunter Milroy. Uh, the <laughs> the uh, Alumni Career Pathway Series is an annual three-part series which is sponsored by RBC and presented by Alumni Relations in collaboration with Career Development and Work Integrated Learning and the Shumka Center for Creative Entrepreneurship. This series hosts alumni panelists and moderators who demystify career paths for current ECU students. I would also encourage you, please, to uh, check in with the QR code on that sign over there, uh, and you'll be entered to win one of three Opus gift cards. So there you go, and you can take it away. Lovely, thank you. Can you hear me all good? Okay, perfect. Um, we'll just start with some biographies, some introductions for our panelists. Uh, we'll start in the end with Paula Torres. So Paula Torres is a designer residing in Canada, originally from Mexico. She studied her Bachelor of Design at Emily Carr University of Art and Design, focused on industrial design. Her interests are directed on community development and programs aimed for a collective impact. Paula often works with clay, textiles, and organic materials, which has developed a passion for ceramics a functional curiosity in researching biomaterials and circular design. Then in the middle, we have Toby Barat here. Toby Barat is a partner and designer at Propeller, a multidisciplinary design studio whose work spans a range of disciplines from lighting and object design to sculpture and exhibition design. Common threads run through all of Propeller's work, an interest in the forms and systems of the natural world a passion for creating useful and ecologically minded objects and experiences, and a desire to make work that will resonate well into the future. And finally, close to me here on the right, we have Herman Chan. Uh, Herman Chan is a designer, creative entrepreneur, and chair at IDSA Seattle. He has spent the past 15 years changing the future of aerospace, automotive, consumer retail, children's products, and healthcare. On his ongoing quest to hone his craft, in building solutions that make a positive difference. He has worked for companies such as Amazon, Boeing, and Seattle's Children's Hospital. Herman has also founded two startups and invented the Juno bassinet, named on Time's list of the 100 best inventions of 2021. As a graduate of Emily Carr Industrial Design Program, Herman looks to share his experience with the next generation of young Canadian designers. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> um, I think we'll just jump right into it here. Our first question on the list, uh, I feel like is a good starting off one. Um, and uh, I'll get you to start us off, Herman, just because I feel like you've had a really, really diverse kind of career path, um, touching in a lot of these different areas, as mentioned in your bio. So are there any recent or not recent career highlights, uh, anything that sticks out to you as like a milestone in your career, a shifting point for you? Yeah, um, I would say my in my career, I had the fortune of diving into aerospace and, and the future of retail. But I do feel recently uh, do getting into a place where I get to do more meaningful designs, things that matter to me, um, uh, from building my own business and, and, and driving for better, more sustainable products, to working uh, to invent the future of pediatric healthcare, uh, you know, for children that are most in need has, uh, you know, it's, I think that's a huge milestone of achieving, doing things that, again, you know, they, they make me feel valued and, and uh, make an impact. To For those. sure. Yeah. yeah. And then I'll, I'll move on to you, Toby, as well, with kind of the flip side with, like, a very honed kind of career path with really pushing through this, this one thing over at Propeller Studios. Is there, would, would you say there's, like, a, a shift you noticed at any point in time just within the studio where you really s saw yourself kind of launch into the direction that you wanted to see yourself in? Um, more, more evolved than launch, I'd say. Okay. We, yeah, we've, we've, sort of, we've been evolving from the beginning. 
that's been our approach. Um, right, right from the beginning, I think when we were at Emily Carr, we actually didn't study in the interior, in the um, industrial design department. We were in we were in sculpture. My partners and I. Um, now, my partner Nick and I both came to Emily Carr intending to go into industrial design, but we got totally seduced by the sculpture department <laughs> and foundation, and and kind of recruited. Um, and it was just so much fun because here at Emily Carr, back then it was <clears throat> on Granville Island, um, in the sculpture department we could be, you know, welding in the morning and printmaking in the afternoon, doing some film at night. We, we just got our hands dirty in everything. Um, and at the time we had a really great mentor here, a guy named Sam Carter, um, really, really wonderful professor. And Sam, we worked a lot with him. He, whenever Sam had a big idea, he's like, let's turn that into an exhibition. So my partners and I worked um, on a number of exhibition design project, projects with Sam while we were here too, and that really influenced us. Um, and so that's something that we carried through our practice. When we began, we started making furniture, eventually found a niche in lighting, but we were always coming up with ideas for exhibitions as well as a way to exercise our curiosity and also to kind of grow our um, skills in, in, in all of what, you know, everything that's encompassed in designing an exhibition from spatial design to typography to, um, to writing to collaborating with uh, museum professionals. Um, um, so I'd say like milestones, interestingly enough for me, I feel like because every four or five years we design a big exhibition, those have been kind of like the milestones. Yeah. And in a way, they, even though they're tangential to our practice of designing and making lighting and, and other objects, um, they really help us kind of stretch and hone, stretch ourselves and hone our skills. Um, and so like a recent milestone would be, we designed a show called Haida Now for the Museum of Vancouver that was about the Haida culture. Um, and the museum has a collection of 450 um, Haida artifacts. And we, the exhibition actually brought these artifacts out and we worked with a fantastic young Haida curator um, and um, designed this exhibition. And it was like very, as you were saying, meaningful, right? Like when you have projects that are deeply meaningful where you can, um, you can, really make uh, some kind of impact um, that's tangible. So that show was, was really good for that as a act of reconciliation between the museum and museum culture and um, indigenous peoples. There's a fraught history there. So um, a lot of what that show was, trying, was doing was try to heal a little bit some of those wounds and to also repatriate some of those artifacts back to Haida Gwaii. So. Yeah, that was a big milestone for us. Yeah, that's great. I like the uh, I like you touching on or kind of switching the the word there to evolution. And there's a couple questions in here that I think we'll come back to, but just we'll touch on it later. Like the how how everyone, which I feel like is a big hurdle in design, how you continue to every, everything you do, the next thing. How does that become an evolution of all the things you've done in the past? Oh, we're good. Okay, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think we'll come back to that in a, in a later question here, but um, I think something that, Paula, you can touch on for us, like as a, re as a recent grad, um, also this panel's really interesting because we kind of have like three generations of grads from Emily Carr, so um, there, there will be a plethora of answers to this question, but uh, do you, coming out of Emily Carr and kind of being thrown into the world of professional design. What were the challenges that you faced when you were thrown into the industry? And on the flip side of that, like what was something when you, when you did find yourself looking at this big scary world of design, what was something that like excited you about where you could possibly see yourself going in the next you know, five, 10 years? Um, yeah, I think a challenge that I face like this past month trying to like apply to multiple jobs and like having a lot of setbacks, it was that 
maybe like a lot of the industries were asking me to have really specific skills or like deeper information about something. And even though I don't regret my time in school as like trying a lot of practices and like working with different materials, um, maybe I would have gained way more like confidence or abilities to fulfill like the expectations they were asking for me. Um, so maybe just really soaked up that really like information from where are you applying and also as like now that I'm trying to continue my project, like my thesis project, like it's like a small company or like a small uh, project, I think a lot of people outside from our practice, like maybe not designers, they do not appreciate all the process and work or effort that you put into like one single piece. So just like as a designers, we really need to advocate for our ideas and our work at the time of presenting it. Um, and for now, like I'm excited. Uh, I recently participated in the interior design exhibition this past month, and this is my second year participating. Last year, I, I won the prototype competition. It was, it was really great because it opened a lot of doors for me. And like this year, I really try to like throw myself there and network. I know it's like something that everyone keeps saying, like you need to make contacts or you need to talk to people. And, but it, it does open a lot of doors for you. And like the collaborations that I'm doing right now, it's, because I, I was able to showcase my work into like these really big pieces. And yeah, just um, I'm excited to, to keep working on my, my own things. Mm -hmm. For yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, thank you. The, the next question is kind of within the same vein, um, which I think a couple, like, Toby uh, and Herman, you guys can maybe answer this from either side, but if, if you were to give someone practical advice who, from someone who just graduated, who they're looking to get into a similar industry as you, um, you know, from the application side or from the hiring manager kind of side, someone who has an established business who's maybe looking for a young designer to join their team, could you give any practical advice of what what you'd be looking for in that person and what, what would be value, valuable to you and your business at the moment? You can start us, Toby, if you like. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess our studio, I mean, we're, our work is specific, but we are sort of generalists in a way. And so everyone that comes into our studio is expected to, um, be willing at least to work with our hands. That's a that's a big part of it. Like we're we want people that have a little bit of experience, but definitely a lot of interest of learning how to make things. Um, so it's it's important, of course, that everyone has the the digital skills that are mandatory for being a designer and a human being these days. But um, but we make things so. Um, that's, you know, it's a bit, it can be a bit of a hurdle because as, as you were saying, like, you know, especially if you're trained as an industrial designer, I'm not sure how much time you guys get to be in the shop or in the studio actually making prototypes or, you know, working with your hands and learning, learning like, you know, okay, you can specify material when you're creating a piece in the computer, but have you worked with Elm before or Walnut or do you, do you know what it's like to bend aluminum or um, have you ever talked to a powder coater or <laughs> these things? So it's not, what we, it's not what we demand of people coming into the studio, but we need like a big curiosity from people. And I think like that's um, kind of what we've always loved about our job is, is learning that stuff. And, you know, I'm getting pretty long in the tooth, but I go in every day and I try to learn and, 
you know, like I'm trying to wrap my head around AI. <laughs> what is that going to do? Um, but yeah, so I mean, in our studio, wood is a primary material. So we 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 are looking for people that at least have a spark of passion for for wood. If they don't, and you know, it's like not everyone can be really good at working with wood or working with their hands. Maybe you find a different, um, maybe you're, you're willing to gain that experience, but you, know, you find a different place in the studio that you fit into. So I don't know, I, I guess I'm, our studio might be atypical, but I don't think so. Like, I think you just need to be curious and able to learn is the biggest thing. For sure. You, mean, you want to touch on that as well? Yeah, sure. My, my advice is, um, is networking uh, and really, really strong problem-solving skills. I, I, you know, if you're going to work with a, a large consultancy or a big tech firm, um, it's not about just how pretty something is. I, th I think it's the, in your portfolio, is explaining why you did something. You know, what was the problem you were trying to solve? How, how, how was it successful and what, how did it meet? The user needs, you know, the, the portfolios that we tend to gravitate towards are, you know, have good strong form, um, but at the same time, really good clear articulation of the story behind why every feature, every function exists um, to solve that human need, uh, grounding it. And uh, and I feel like the the major differentiator with um, young professionals coming to uh, a consultancy that is 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 those that are really engaged. They really take the time to network. Uh, might be not your core strength of like being very, you know, out there, but like just really trying to find a mentor, trying to get in, being tenacious about it. Even if there's no job, constantly um, connecting with the companies that you're very interested in. Because they say one day that job opportunity might come up. And they will think of you, and you might get that call. And I would say that that did, in the past, work for me. <laughs> Getting my career start at Teague, having come from uh, Emily Carr. For sure. I think another interesting thing that comes up is, or at least something I've experienced after leaving Emily Carr, is um, when you have these kind of conversations with people who are established in the industry, um, or someone who's, you know, someone who you'd be interested in being hired by, but they maybe don't have a space for you, um, you know, and they use a lot of these words that you two just brought up, like, you know, you need to be tenacious, you need to be creative, you need to be open, like, easily teachable, all these things, um, I guess, and then a question that comes up for me after I hear those is, if, if I am all of these things, how do I show those to you in an effective way? So, like, if you're looking for someone who's teachable, how do you find out that they're teachable? Where do you look for that trait? Like, is it, can you, can you find it in their portfolio? Do you need to meet them in person? Like, it's hard to kind of, if you have these traits, really know where to showcase them. So I don't, I don't know if you have felt the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they ask for like, as you say, oh, that you need to be like really creative and it's like, okay, but how do you know I'm creative? Like if I'm not working with you at the moment. Um, so yeah, like what are you looking for that? Like in terms of... Yeah, it's almost like, like not even, it's know? like we know, we know what's being looked for. Where are you looking for it? Mm -hmm. Is it in the portfolio? Is it in all these other places? It's, it's kind of this, this bit of a dance that I feel like Sometimes I'm trying to dance and I'm got two left feet. <laughs> yeah, I know it's 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 hard. I think um, I mean it's it's actually why we started our studio. There was no play, there was no place for us. <laughs> there was no one to hire us. There were there were very few companies that were. I mean, okay, when we graduated in 1996, um, we all did our own things for you know four or five years, and then we came together and we started. Um, because we knew we wanted to, we wanted to make objects for people's homes and spaces. We wanted to be involved in that, um, but there was 
very few, there was no bocce, there was no and, there, you know, these companies are, they were still 10 years out. Um, so we, we had to, we had to make it up. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a really, I really strongly believe that you, you have to have, you have to have grit and you have to work on your, your portfolio and you have to, you should work on it all your life. Like even while you're working for Propeller, <laughs> you should have like side projects going on where it's like you burn a little midnight oil to, to take your vision forward because I'd like to see more young people do what we have done. It's not, I'm not, it's, I won't tell you it's an easy path to forge that, that road for yourself. But um, it's like, I want to see what you guys would create if you had your own studios, right? But now you have the advantage of there being uh, still a young design community. Just from, from my perspective, when I'm thinking about um, furniture and lighting and, and products and whatnot, it's still a small community of, of companies that you could work for here. But get your foot in the door and 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 get in there and like Herman's saying like you have to be tenacious and you have to and you know like um, we haven't been able to hire that I mean we've we've kept our studio really small for on purpose because we like the culture of there being four or five people in the studio it's it's really calm and it's it's productive and it's and I never wanted to be a manager of many many people. <laughs> I want to design and make things, so we've kept our studio very small for that reason. The thing that I don't like about that is that there are wonderful young people that come to us, and I don't have the capacity um, to hire them, but I do my best to point them to other studios, and I do my best to. Let, teach them everything I can because when we were coming up, like the people that we had worked for that that we learned a bit from working in their studios, they didn't want, as soon as we went on out on our own, they didn't want to know us. They saw us as competition. It was a generational thing. Your, you guys have grown up with open source culture and this different way of thinking about more, uh, it's a more abundant culture, more sharing um, everyone's kind of realizing that, you know, we can grow the pie rather than trying to divide it into smaller and smaller pieces. So um, th that was a very rambling, <laughs> roundabout way of saying that y you just have to be tenacious. It's I know it's uh, your portfolio has to say a lot for you, so you always have to make it better. I, I feel like Toby's a perfect case study. If I were to approach Toby, I would say this, you know, wealth of 20 years of experience in ID. How do I, I'm interested in lighting design. Like I know I cannot work with him or his company because they're keeping it small, but the question to you as a problem solver is, oh, well, how, he just said like, I'm here to help. So, you know, could you do, can you just talk to him and say, hey, can I do a quarterly with you just to see where I'm at? Like the, I think you'll find that in the industry, designers are really wanting to support young creatives, you just need to be open to reach out and work around their schedule and be consistently, when I say tenacious, you need to be consistently there. Like, you, you know, you don't just drop off after two meetings and you disappear. You know, like it, if you're constantly there, something might strike. Um, and to answer your question is the, con like where you see solving a problem means having a really good process that is consistent across your portfolio. So, you know, big flags in a portfolio of, you know, one that has deep process, but all the other projects show not much concept development, don't show much prototyping or down selection prototyping is a huge flag. I probably wouldn't con continue with it because there's going to be a lot of other candidates that show why they made that decision visually. And, and that's important because it shows that they're not stubborn. They're not stuck like, that's the coolest thing. I'm going to go do that. Because at least in our industry, like you're, you're not solving for yourself. You're solving for like a huge demographic of people, and you, you need to understand what their needs are, um, and how are you going to go ahead and do that? And it has to be through process, and this beautiful process that I think Emily Carr teaches, which is you know research, understand phase, ideation, you know really develop that idea, refine it, and then 
deliver against it, right? And a lot of prototyping in between. So. Yeah, yeah, I think um, those are both very great points. Um, that's in in kind of the, the past few months that I've been trying to, you know, rebuild my own practice and, and get back in there, um, you know, get, get a foot in the door. It's, that has consistently come up. It's, it's yeah. like you said, it's like having every project have the same process and just having it be like so evidently clear yeah. what you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Like I mentor so many students and every time, it's especially in your second or third year, you, you're just trying to learn and, and documenting that process wasn't top of mind. And that five projects going at the same time. <laughs> that that sucks. And so, like my my advice is like ah, like good thing. Like you just described, you articulated well, but you don't you didn't capture it. So I'm sorry. You you either have to go back and try to get that work, or redo it. And and it's a lot more work to do it. Um, but showing showing it is it will be helpful because you you exit school with pretty limited portfolio. And a lot of your peers have done the same problems. <laughs> like they all look very similar. How do you differentiate yourself, right? Yeah, definitely. I think this is maybe a good time to come back to the that kind of question around evolution uh, that you brought up earlier. And I'll keep it pretty open ended, and you can go with it where you where you might. But um, I think there's a like I mentioned earlier, there's kind of this desire or maybe this expectation to having everything evolve from the previous thing you've, you've just completed. Um, you know, the next job needs to be bigger. The next company you work for needs to be, needs to pay you better. Or even on a smaller scale, like, like App Propeller, or how do you, the next exhibition you do, how does it, how do you evolve? Um, and in turn with that, with the process, how do you show that evolution? Um, and so I'd be really curious to hear from all the perspectives. Um, maybe we can start with you, Paul, just with the work you've, you completed in university and stuff. How did you, do you, did you have any methods in place or did you figure out any methods by the time you got to the end of fourth year to learn from the previous project you've just done and make sure that you don't make either the same mistakes or you complete the same successes in the following project? Uh, yeah, I mean, just a little bit of background. My, my thesis project was biomaterials. I, I developed like different recipes from organic residues, just like orange peels or like spinach. And I, I made like um, garment pieces with them. And then, um, for example, like in the first ex exhibition that I was part, um, I only show the material itself, like, oh, this is what I did. And I got a lot of feedback from either the judges or like people just coming by and asking like, what is this thing? Like, I, I'm just seeing like colors like hanging there. So um, I think from where I evolved, it was really trying to showing them what I was capable of, of like, and what the material was capable of at the same time. So I, I was just, um, I collaborate with Workbench Studio, which um, he's in Gastown, and we like he told me like, okay, you need to think about more of this other than just the textile because that was just my idea. Like I was like, I just want to do textiles, but it was there were so many possibilities, and like right now he and I are working um, to make like panels or like just dividers for like interior spaces or. Um, I did a couple of lampshades. Like I'm still continuing with the garment part, but I think you, I was, as you say, maybe Herman, like I was really stubborn, like I, this is my thing and I don't want to move away from this. Um, but there is no improvement in your practice and like in your ideas if you don't try things that maybe you are not willing to do. Mm -hmm. um, so just be we, be willing, responsive to the ideas and the feedback that they, like other people um, tell us. And also you like be willing to, to share because if they share, it, it, I think it's really nice to be reciprocate with others. Um, and yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Do you wanna? Um, I mean, 
to further the evolution metaphor, there's natural selection in everything we do. It's like, if we don't do a good job for a client, well, that's <laughs> the end of us for them, right? And so um, we're always trying to evolve to understand our clients and the marketplace and our materials and our competition. And I'd say that's like we're not, that's not our strong point. So we're trying to evolve to become better at that. We, from the beginning, like I was talking to Herman, and we, he said, wow, three creatives all together in one business. Like, how do you do it? Well, in, and we all studied, you know, in the same school and the same program and everything. So it took us a while to evolve ourselves into different aspects of the business. Um, and and I, I can say, like, at first we just didn't have processes for everything because not having come up through other design studios where we could see people, like see hopefully a, a well-functioning business or maybe even be fine if it was a really badly functioning business because you'd sit back and go, well, I wouldn't do it like that. You know, but we just didn't have any template at all. So not only were we trying to um, learn and evolve our design process, but we were trying to assimilate business functions and become dis decent marketers and, and stewards over the company's finances and all these things. So for us, the evolution is, is ongoing. It's, gonna, it's, you know, it's, it's never going to be complete. There's always something. And that's something about being an entrepreneur, being a business person, like it's just never done. It's that's the exciting part. It's also the hard part. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I feel like my biggest as you, I, I was able to climb that corporate ladder, right? Like industrial designer or junior industrial designer, senior designer, and eventually um, started my own companies and became an entrepreneur um, for the reason that I'm always interested in constantly pushing myself to learn more and, and to create more impactful solutions that can change the world. And it's great that you have a lens of just design, but I felt that just being a des consultant designer that advises companies, oh, this is the next big thing. A lot of times those things, when I see it go out, it doesn't change the world. And so I realized that in, you need to have a better understanding of marketing and business that kind of run the world. <laughs> And, and, and try to bridge that. And so I had the fortune of starting my companies. Um, and, and then, uh, like, eventually moving to Seattle Children's is, was an interesting kind of evolution because you'd think after starting a company, I, could, I was considering joining some big tech companies as creative director. So it's a very clear ladder. And I had a kumbaya moment where it's like, is this about, like, is this going to make me happier? Is this going to be what I really want, or is this what looks good on LinkedIn, <laughs> and like what is, pe what is what people think should happen. And, and I, I, I said, I asked, you have to dig deep in yourself and ask, what do you really want, and what's, what's going to help you? And so joining Seattle Children's, I didn't become a creative director, I'm an innovation design strategist, but the, the work that I get to do, and it goes back to like the original question, is like, oh, I'm most proud, but my biggest milestone is being able to do more meaningful work now because I had to kind of go through the different experiences to get there um, and kind of like put it back to like the audience, which is like if you're a young professional, I think how you'd apply that is instead of being headstrong on saying, oh, I must get this job, I must, it must be like a junior designer, industrial designer, that path, especially now when industrial design and design is evolving rapidly and don't think too much about title and think about what that next role may help you get. It might not be your ideal dream. It might not be in the field or the, the expertise that you're looking to grow in. But if it's in UX or if it's in X, like you, are, it, you will be able to extract, just getting your foot in the door and extracting those experiences to lean back to where you want to go um, is, is going to help define your career, right? Yeah, I think I had a, or maybe was in like a smaller scale version of this yeah. kind of similar move when you, when you moved to uh, Seattle Children's with, when I got back to Canada a couple months ago and I was, had a similar thought of like, 
you know, it's it's obvious, like you said, like like the the evolution for LinkedIn, the like what good, what's the evolution on paper, yeah. but then also like what's the evolution for me, and like what's the evolution for what I want to achieve in design, and it might not be, you know, it might not be stepping up in a role. It might be like I need to step sideways in content in what I'm designing, mm -hmm. and so I feel like. I'm facing a similar thing where you get back and you obviously want to keep evolving. You know, what's next? I've done these two or three things here and there. What's next? Um, the one on paper is the, like you said, junior designer. You know, you go on LinkedIn and the ones that say junior designer and you're like, that's what I want. But it might not be, it might not be wrapped up under the present of junior designer like the job you want could be called something completely different. And, and yeah, I think looking past that was something I had to realize pretty quickly, which is a good point. Um, this one will get a little sentimental for a moment. <laughs> uh, I think this is, like I said earlier, with, with, this, with kind of like three generations of, of Emily Carr alumni here, I think this could be, there's going to be some interesting answers to this. But if you could go back and give your third year self a piece of critical advice, uh, what would it be? You, you can take a minute to think. It's a, Bit of a bigger one, but yeah. If someone has one off the bat, they can just jump in. Okay, sure. Um, I think, like, you should really soak up all the information you want regarding where you want to lead your growth as a designer. Um, look out for opportunities like either inside or outside of school. Um, look up for cops, for internships. And maybe I think also as a designers, we sometimes are a little bit hard on ourselves, like judging our projects or criticize them like with really high expectations. Um, but yeah, like you never know what's the project that is gonna get you into the industry that you want. Uh, so just, I think, I don't know, when, when I was in school, I worked a lot of with the Shumka Center, and I really tried to cultivate those relations that I did in the process, and I, at first I didn't thought that they were important, but now having those contacts or just like those uh, persons to go back and like ask them for advice, or just even like talk about random things, it doesn't need to be about design. Um, it's been really helpful. And I think also another part is that I regret sometimes not believing in my judgment or in myself. Um, it's always important to be confident of like who you are as an individual and as a designer. Like, I know sometimes you might think like, oh, this is the worst design I've done. Or like, I don't want to do this presentation. Uh, but it really says and helps a lot if you present it, like if it's the best, like the best project that you're gonna do. <laughs> um, so yeah. Uh, I I, I want to rift off of you. I think it's a really great point, Paula. Like if I would do my advice to third year is like, who cares about third year or who cares? Take five years at school. I would prioritize getting internship any day, mm -hmm. especially with a company. Because that's your opportunity to leverage your student <laughs> yeah. and get 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 ex actual real professional network experience, um, and 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 graduate later, not with your co like your 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 alumni, but pff, you know it's not about that. I think it's if you can uh, look for. And I would say a lot of successful students come out with from different schools come out with portfolios with actual big names like Herman Miller and like all these things that they can show. So that is already one upping, um, you know, the rest of the field, the competitors. So I think uh, to be competitive, you need to do the same. And I, 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 th I think it goes also back to like what I said is like, I, it, it, was a, it's, it's a, it was a struggle. I kicked myself in the butt so many times because I did not document or keep <laughs> my process. Yeah. And redoing it is easier said than done. It's brutal, and I did not redo it most of it. <laughs> so I didn't have the. Uh, I think uh, I think my portfolio would have been even better because I had all the stories with me. It just, yeah. Yeah, diving back into the archives is not an easy task no. for sure. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I 
really like what both of you said. I f fully agree. Um, I would say um, really lean into collaboration. That there is so much strength there. That's like, and whether you like it or not, that's what your future is. It's collaboration. Um, I, I taught a workshop at another design school in the city recently, <clears throat> and um, the students were broke up, broken up into um, into groups. And I watched the group dynamics of this collaborative process, <laughs> and uh, there was only one uh, group out of five that collaborated in a way that I recognized as a proper collaborative process. Um, this is, I know like when you're at school, um, sometimes it's really hard to, to work in groups, but this is what the future is gonna look like for you. You're gonna be on teams, you're gonna have difficult clients, you're gonna have clients that set you a really hard brief and you work your tail off and then they don't answer the phone for, you know, a month maybe. And then all of a sudden they're like, where, where is it? And you're, you know, all this kind of like stuff is going to happen in your professional career. Um, so th think, of your, think of yourself as like an architect, a film director. Uh, think of these, you know, these professions where you have to rely on lots of other people. That's what a designer has to do. It's not just you. So. Yeah, I have, I have to say, yeah, it, I think you nailed it. Like, the designers, a designer is a catalyst. Everything revolves around you, right? Like, engineering revolves around you. The, like, the pr product management, the, the business guys, they revolve around you because you're building the idea. You're, cl you're representing, fundamentally, the user at the end that's using it and what they need. That's, like, no one else is doing that. But you need to be able to communicate and bring everyone together to deliver against your vision. And so co collaboration, communication, that's like your, like, that's the skills that you need to be successful, right? Yeah, yeah that's all, all great points for sure. Um, I think, we'll go back to you, Toby, just for, this is kind of a specific question, but I feel like it jumps off some of the stuff you just talked about. Um, there's, especially when you, or this is at least my experience, um, when you got to fourth year uh, and people are, you know, look kind of looking over that horizon and saying, you know, it's, it, the end is near, uh, wh where are we going next? The discussion inevitably comes up of starting a studio. Um, and it's always kind of like a murmur underneath, underneath everything else because it's scary. Um, and I think especially starting it right out of school. Um, do you, I think it would be really helpful to hear advice from you, especially coming from, you know, starting with three, a group of co three core people from the same program at the same school, starting the studio, like basically like the do's and don'ts or things you realize really quickly just by doing and, and taking that leap and starting propeller. Um, yeah, kind of what it was like building a studio almost right out of school. It, it, was, it was an experiment. <laughs> it was an experiment because, as I said before, we didn't, we didn't have a template. We, we did know some really great creative people, but they were all in disparate fields, right? So we drew on those relationships. But um, I think, you know, going, going back to the what would I tell myself then that I know now, a big one is just don't try and reinvent every single wheel yourself, right? So you've got to get out there and talk to people and and maybe like Herman and I were talking at the beginning, like if Propeller had brought on a business partner along with the three creatives, it didn't seem possible and we didn't even know to do that at the beginning, but um, if we had brought on a business partner in the beginning, it would have sped our evolution radically. Um, how, do you, how do you work with uh, two colleagues that you've studied with? Well, there has to be a deep respect and, and friendship goes a long, a long way and, you, gotta, and you, have to, you have to nurture that, right? You, you've gotta make sure that 
this thing doesn't rupture meaningful friendship. And that, that's a powerful tool for, um, for creating a process that's respectful for everyone that's involved. Um, and then I, I'll move to a, spe a specific question uh, for you, Herman, and it's kind of about your involvement uh, as chair at IDSA. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you could speak a little bit, a little bit about just what that is for you, and and how your role kind of fits in there, as well as um, something that I feel like f for me needed to be demystified a little bit um, as a as a student at Emily Carr was these organizations, they, you know, they pop up here and there throughout your, throughout your education. And like, they've all got these acronyms like IDSA and all these things. And you're like, what are these things? I don't know what these organizations are. Um, and so do you, like, how would you recommend young designers to interact with these organizations like IDSA? Like, how do you seek them out? How do they understand what they are and just either get involved or, or, yeah, basically just how to interact with them. Yeah, um, so IDSA, Industrial Design Society of America. Um, I'm the uh, board member and chair currently uh, for the Seattle chapter. I've been running that for almost four years, so it's two year terms. Um, and really, the I remember IDSA, like back when I was in Emily Carr, it felt very disconnected. It was like based out of Seattle. <laughs> it felt like, but they te technically represented Vancouver too, and it felt like we didn't get much time and day from them. And 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 um, I think that was that's number one. Now running the show is very tough to be a, a nonprofit organizer on your own time to try to plan events. Number one is tough, and then doing it not in your own locale has been even more challenging. So I would say that's also why IDSA was IDSA Northwest a year ago. And now it's just IDSA Seattle. <laughs> so, and it is honestly just focused on Seattle, um, or at least the Bellingham to, to that whole area. And um, we, how, how do you best leverage it is, you know, for number one is that for our local chapter, you don't need to be a member. I think there's a perception it's like, oh, I have to be a member in order to access these events. For our chapter, we do not require a membership. Um, what we strive to do is create especially coming from the pandemic, to create a more inclusive community. We felt during the pandemic, when I started joining, it was just like, I think designers are somewhat social. We live and breathe design, and it's healthy to talk to each other. Uh, and that's what we should be. We should be a, a, a way to, 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 to bring people together, and that's what we tried to do. During the pandemic, we had, uh, at Seattle Chapter, we just tried to do a lot of online sessions we worked with Rhino who uh, you know showed us the new tools we worked with um, Keyshot who gave a free license to Keyshot and showed their new tools and we did a lot of education series in fact we had Katie Ma who was at that time Arcteryx one of the uh, climb, climbing designers she's now at North Face man managing their team um, one of their design teams there and she spoke, so I was trying to bring in Vancouver designers to speak to, again, not just the Allies, but those that were available online. Um, now, what are we doing? Uh, we're doing more in-person events. Um, so uh, I, I do recommend those from Vancouver to join. Um, I know it's a far trek, but if you join these, it, it design, Seattle has a great dynamic design community. You know, designers from Microsoft, Meta, through to smaller consultancies like Tactile Teague, Philips design is there, or, uh, you know, REI is there. So there's a huge, and, and so everyone, including students, go, perfect time to network. Um, so that's how I would take advantage is if you can make the trek, join the events, um, and, and, and network yourself and get yourself out there. Awesome. That's, yeah, that's unfortunate that they've just collapsed down in Seattle, but, I mean, it, it's understandable. Like you said, probably hard-reaching reaching over the border with, with all of their, you know, events and stuff. Um, similar, similar kind of bridge, but we'll open it up to everyone. Um, are there any, or what are some good resources, professional affiliations, stuff like IDSA, social media accounts, uh, anything that you recommend to follow or anything that helped you 
um, at, at really any point, um, whether when, when you were in school, after, for networking purposes, or just to, you know, something to keep inspiration. I know I follow a bunch of people just, just so I can watch what they make, and I'm like, that's so cool. <laughs> Helps me, you know, st stay creative. Start us on my end, Paula. Um, yeah, I, when I was at school, I did an, a co-op with a um, company or corporation slash culture entity called ISM Arts and Culture. Um, the founder is Scott Mallory. I, I know his work with Emily Carr a couple of times for like the TEDx talks. Um, he's a really great resource. Like, um, when I was on his team, we work for, or we partnered with a company called Spetra. You might know it's like this yoga app that has like a triangle. Uh, we were creating like VR immersive spaces and like for me, it was like just mind blowing. Like <laughs> I, I was quite good at like 3D modeling, but I didn't like working with it. But I know it was something that it was um, like, like a good opportunity to take. And I really appreciate how he advocates for students. And he guided me and others in my team. Like it was um, me, as in, like I was in third year and then was like some to order for masters, like uh, really from different areas and from UX, UI, and like he really trusts our points of views and our opinions and like giving us this uh, big positions on like big products, projects that maybe others want because uh, we are students, we'll see in the process of learning. And yeah, I, I think he's really good at just um, pushing you out there and be like, you can, like, you can do this. <laughs> and in terms of like social media accounts, um, like if you want, or if you're interested in biomaterials, like or working like as I did, uh, there's a website called materiorum.com. It has like a bunch of recipes and a bunch of like, bunch of researches from um, Alto University and like just a lot of universities in Europe and it's like open source in Instagram's account. Um, there's like Fab Lab, which offers courses. Some of them are free, some of them are not, but I've took, um, I think two so far and like pretty accessible, like student budget. <laughs> and Fabric Academy and Biodesign. Those are also Instagram accounts that you might want to look into. Yeah. Wow. I want that list. <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, I don't know. I, we don't belong to any organizations per se. I think it, part of, um, partially because we came out of the studio program and then we sort of became industrial designers um, and we work back and forth between art and design. Um, we never really found a home in that respect, but I guess like our home is really like our clients are largely interior designers and architects and developers. So we're constantly networking within those communities. And there are lots of, um, less after the pandemic, but um, there are, you know, meetups and evenings and lecture series and all that stuff is starting to come back and it's important. But for me personally, it's, it's YouTube. Like, I just love YouTube. <laughs> you know, I can be watching some old dude who's like a master wood turner, um, you know, at lunchtime while I'm eating my lunch, or I can, you know, lately I want everyone to know about Theaster Gates. He was just the most amazing artist out there right now. Uh, he works out of Chicago, Theaster Gates. Look this guy up. Like, write what, that down? what a practice, write that down? like what an inspirational um, practice, what a, what a maker, what a community builder, just, in, just incredible. So I'm always looking for artists and designers and scientists who are doing cool things that get my mind firing and make me want to go back in the studio. Um, yeah, I, I'd say like... Be active on LinkedIn or, or build your LinkedIn account now that you're you're entering into the field. Um, follow IDSA Seattle. We do have an upcoming event uh, January 11th. Um, so so it's it'd be a really big panel with some of the 
um, you know, very old designers that have shaped design in the uh, in Seattle, um, and that's hosted by Steve Kaneko. Steve Kaneko was the first industrial designer at Microsoft who built out HoloLens and Surface and all the design ID teams working working with him. Um, I, I do think also like kind of like who you should follow is actually your own peers. Like I, I know that right now you're in school and they technically are your competitors because you might be applying to the same jobs. What you're going to find later on in your career is that that is your network that is going to move with you and grow with you and you're going to support each other. So be good to each other and be like, they, they work with each other, uh, you, you know, um, and um, I, I, yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's a that's a great point for sure. I think huge, huge, huge leverage point, and one of those ones that like it doesn't come up until it comes up, and then you're like all of a sudden, you know, you're you're some guy you met in third year like hits you on a message on LinkedIn, and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah. and then something grows out of that, you know. So, I yeah, that's it feels like it's it lays dormant until it comes up, and then it's really useful immediately. So, it's a great point. Um, and then kind of one uh, more for Toby and Paulo, but the um, you with your with your grad project and you know kind of continuing it after um, and then as well as like you said um, just when we were chatting before earlier with kind of defining what Propeller does as a studio, I find a, a lot of the time you know there are very few there are very few designers that are creating that's that are saying you know this is ux design and that and they like slap that label on and they feel comfortable with it so you kind of bridging bridging the gap or or working in between sculpture and design uh and then you kind of like with biomaterials and like also kind of dipping into food almost how do you how do you explain properly or present your designs as and you know, do them justice as as to how you want them to be seen to other people who walk up to, like you said, you know, walk up to your project and are just like, I have no idea what this is. Like, explain it to me. Yeah, um, I think documentation. <laughs> I I think like for for my stuff specifically, like if you just tell them, oh, I cook spinach, and then you have like this textile, it's not like a really good explanation. So maybe. Um, just like really explaining, like from my experience in the exhibition, they were asking for like every single ingredient that was in the recipe or like the process, the drying process of it. Um, how do I use it? How like much did last? So I felt like before um, I didn't thought about that process. I was like, well, in my mind it makes sense, but for someone else it doesn't. And yeah, I mean, I think, sorry, I just, my mind. Um, sorry. It kind of sounds like you're, yeah. you're saying like, like especially with, with your project, like it's, it's so complex and it does dip into all these areas at different points throughout the process. So like really, you know, no pun intended, boiling it down yeah. um, to like, you know, these are the four steps um, and simplifying it so that so that you don't overwhelm them mm -hmm. with all these different steps and then they leave and they still don't really understand what it is or how you made it. So, yeah, I like what helped me a lot. It was like, oh, it's like if you were just making a soup, like you're just cooking and then you're putting this into your mouth and it's your cake like this is like the process of how it is. And also like talking to maybe people in chemistry or like in the um, biology practice, it was like pretty interesting. Them, like some of them were just asking me like, oh, what flavor is this? Or can I, can I taste it? Or like, <laughs> um, but for example, like um, this, it was like this, um, I don't remember his name, but he was in, in the interior design exhibition and he, works for um, BioLove, if I'm not wrong. But what this company does is you basically go and you give them the, your project 
and your product, I mean, and like they test it for like every single thing. So like how it reacts to heat, how it reacts to water, like how it reacts to the wear and like how it's gonna last. So it's for them to test like sustainable products. And he really was interested um, just even if I left my piece outside or like, oh, if someone wore it, like if the, if our like human liquids or like, yeah, it was, it was gonna like, affect the textile um, so just just having like two the two different perspectives like I've never thought of like people asking me like oh can I eat it or can I just um, try to like use it for like certain hours and run and like see how it reacts to my sweat like yeah um, so yeah just like interest to see other perspectives from a different angle uh, from other people and I, guess, and I guess as you continue to present this project, you under you probably get a pretty good handle on when I'm explaining this project to a chemist, I'll explain it like this. When I'm yeah. explaining it to a designer, I'll explain it like this. Mm. And so, yeah, maybe it's a little bit of knowing your audience yeah, and knowing even what they want to like, hear. When I was telling my parents, they were like, oh, you're making like a spinach shirt. Like, good. <laughs> like, like, why am I paying like so much money to the university if you're making a spinach shirt? So, yeah, you really need to... Um, know your audience as you know, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's another skill, but it's a huge one that if you can, if you can manage to get on top of it, writing, just being able to write about what you do is a superpower. Like, um, like you were saying, Herman, of documenting process and showing that, that visual uh, representation. If you can actually articulate what you're trying to do um, and pull in all the threads of design history, art history, science, uh, whatever the heck it is that led you to where you are, um, that's like really powerful. And it's not easy. Like, you know, it, increasingly as, as, humans in any discipline we have to be so well-rounded like gone is the day where you can be the person just sitting in the cubicle doing the same thing in and out every day right for better or for worse i think it's for better and ai is going to help with this too um but oh go, kind of going back to resources like i just being the old dog who has sketchbooks and I fill up sketchbooks with ideas and thoughts and drawings and whatnot and I've got a stack of them and I don't know where that drawing <laughs> was that I'm thinking of that I know I did 10 years ago and how the heck, you know, and I, or, or ideas that I've written down that are just lost in sketchbooks. So recently, my partner Pam said, there's this thing called day one or one day or whatever. It's like a journaling app. And she's like, you need to start using that. And I'm like, I don't need, I'm not, not a journaler. I'm not doing that. But I fired this thing up and I realized, oh my gosh, like if I had been, if I, this had been my sketchbook for the last 20 years with all the tagging ability and whatnot, like I just love it because as you move through your career, there are going to be threads that started right here in art school of interests and proclivities and directions. And you're, those are going to weave their way throughout your career. They're going to pop up someday. Like you're going to be working like 15 years from now on some important project and something that you thought of or started working on in art school is going to pop up, you know? And anyway, I find that app super amazing because I can chuck my drawings into it. I can just write. I can have threads of thoughts that I tag so that I can go back and every time I hit that tag, there's what I've been thinking about. And I can see it, how it's been evolving for two months at this point. <laughs> but it could have been 20 years, you know. So anyway, I think, I think writing is how we bridge the gap between... Um, art and design and explaining it to our clients. Um, yeah. Do you have a vested interest in that app? Because I'm sold. No. <laughs> no. Royalties? You making royalties on I wish app? I did because I love it, but uh, no, I don't. Um, you, it, feel free to touch on this as well with your... No? You're okay. Okay, cool. 
Um, Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, I was just going to move to the last one, which is just a kind of general closing thoughts. Uh, is there anything you know you wish you could tell your student self, or anything you want to tell these student selves? <laughs> um, yeah, just any kind of closing thought about your practice and and how you kind of ended up where you were. Um, Advice you would have given yourself. Yeah, being a student is great, like really take advantage of that. Um, like, I, I took a lot of like electives here in uh, school and that has really helped me to like have different knowledge. Like even though maybe it was not related to my major, um, it was like it's something that has helped me or allowed me to stand out in like interviews or like just to applying to jobs. and. I mean, for example, uh, when I took a class here that it was uh, it was professional practices, and I, I took it with Laura Kosak, and she told me that I needed to like she gave me this assignment where I needed to interview someone who I admire in their practice, and um, I interview this person, and like now she's my boss, like. Uh, we made like a really great connection. I didn't talk to her like for two years after that, but when I noticed that she was like asking for someone uh, for her studio um, to help her, like I, I was just like, oh, hello. And she was like, oh, you're Paula, you interview me. Like she, she already knew who I was and like my, my, my practice and like she has looked into my portfolio. Um, so yeah, like I never thought just by interviewing this person in, in a class, I was able to get a job. So even though I was applying to a lot of them, none of them called me and just like out of nowhere, she already knew me. So that was a really quick, um, good experience and from, from school. So yeah, I think just really take advantage of, of what school offers you at the moment. Um, and as Herman said, like it doesn't matter if you graduate in four years or three years or I actually switched majors three times mm -hmm. before I reached into industrial design. So just having that background and that experience, like those up and downs, helped me to like narrow my options and like knowing what my true passion was. Um, yeah. Awesome, thanks. I've sort of forgotten what the question is. <laughs> Anything you wish you could tell your past student self or mm. closing thoughts? Because we're open yeah. to the audience after. Well, I mean, <laughs> propeller, um, propeller, is Propeller's client a lot of the time. Um, so we're, we're designing, we're giving ourselves design briefs and coming up with products that we're testing against the market. And um, and I would say, so sometimes like it's, there there is, uh, we understand our user or we're trying to and, and, and the design, you know, is really responsive to that, but, um, or we're trying to be, <clears throat> but we're also trying to use our imaginations and our creativity to, to design something new and fresh. And um, I think what I've learned and what my partners and I struggle with every day is to be as weird as we can be. Like, we don't allow ourselves to be very weird. Like. We started Freaky Fridays now, <laughs> where it's like the thing is, okay, no, no email after ten o'clock, and let's make sure we do something different. You know, let's let's pursue something weirder because every time we, well, not every time, when we go out on a limb and we do something weird, we either fall flat on our face and we learn a lot from that, and sometimes we spend a lot of energy doing that, but that's okay. And sometimes it's like, wow, people are, re that resonates with people. That's interesting because it's, and I, and I think like in this moment where human creativity is, is now being challenged by AI, um, I think like we have to lean into our, our strange individual perspectives or dig deeper into our, cultural histories and just not be afraid to be a little bit weird. Okay. That's nice. Yeah, I, I, 
my question is back to you. What, why did you join industrial design? Like, why did you do this? And I think you always need to ask yourself that question if it's to, you know, again, solve problems to make an impact, to drive change for wherever you feel is, is for the positive. I can tell you, like, the word of encouragement, when you get into this industry, you'll love it. It's, I, I, I know very little designers that don't become state designers because the amount of impact you're going to have for, you know, others, for like the people that you touch is incredible. But that path is nonlinear. And that's where never be stuck on what is next and what you must get and be open to like, hey, how am I going to achieve this? Like your story is about problem solving and creating opportunities, branches that open up for you to reach what you came in to do. So I think, again, that word of being tenacious and, and resilient and just drive home, like make, make big change. But and, 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 and yeah, like it's going to be nonlinear. Be OK with that. It's your story. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, we'll open it up to the audience. Audience questions. Uh, sure, we can start right here. Yeah, so I've actually got a few questions. Um, as design consultancy um, like owners, like st starters, how do you compete with like the best? How do you compete with like Herman Miller or being able to innovate or getting up there in the design world? How do you put your name out there? Yeah, it's, it's uh, I guess we, We've never really looked at it that way. We've just, we kind of competed against ourselves mm -hmm. is how we've seen it. We've always sort of felt like, wow, we could be so much better than we are. Like every, I think it's just a constant thing in our studio. It's just like, really, we did that? Well, it seemed good at the time, but man, we could do a lot better, so let's keep going. And we did that, you know, that's kind of how we got off, got ourselves off the ground. But we've also really benefited from a change in the culture in our industry um, where, you know, when we started, um, when we started 15 years ago on the trajectory that we're now, because we've been going for 20 years, but the first five years we were doing a little bit of everything, trying to figure out where we, where's our niche, right? Um, but uh, when, when we first started out, it was the era of the internet when there were blogs and, and our work just bounced around. We were really lucky. We were just at the right place at the right time. And we had sh pe you know, some lighting pieces in off-site shows in New York and San Francisco. And our work would bounce around the internet and designers, interior designers would call us up from Dallas or New York or whatever. And we were selling work into the States and that got us going. Um, but it was really frustrating here in Vancouver because all of the local designers, they wanted to specify Italian lighting in their projects. Um, and, you know, there was like one project where we got our foot in the door. It was a big public project and it just got scuttled at some point. And my partner Pam just called up and this is maybe the first bold thing we ever did. And she's just like, I need to meet with the with the head architect of the company. <laughs> and we went in and we just said, look, this is, a, like, this is a public space in Vancouver. Why are you bringing in European lighting for this space? We, we proposed this great project. Like, give us a shot, right? And they did. And that helped. And then, that, then the culture started to change where suddenly local is the thing. And now, like, having a studio where our interior designer, architect clients can send their clients to come down, our wood shop, our shop is in the back, our design um, office is up front, is up top, you know, they come in and they see it, like, I, oh, you're the person that's making this? It's made right here? This is really powerful. It's part of the story that we can tell to leverage, um, you know, our value in the market. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, because for me, like, 
the way I see it, industrial design at its core is a business. So no matter what, I feel like I would want to, I mean, you know, it's your consultancy, but no matter what, I, I, I would try to aim for like the best. I would try to innovate, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, and then uh, I've got a question for you um, about your, um, your sorry, sorry, the, um, your, your clothing. How would you describe that to like a company or people that want to manufacture that? Like, how do you prove that what you're doing is worth it? Because I feel like when you join a consultancy, there are a lot of limitations for cost manufacturing, how do you go proving that your idea is worth it? Um, yeah, like, mm, during my, my four year, uh, my mentor was, uh, well, I had Keith, but I also had Sophie. Um, I forgot her last name, but yeah. Gar. Gar, Sophie Gar. Um, but I think she really, got me to understood that what I was trying to sell or what I was trying to communicate to others, it was something really imperishable and like really try to embrace that it was a product that it was gonna disappear at some point. And you know, right now we have a lot of problems with like pollution and plastic and like my textile is not a solution, it's just an alternative that you can use really proposing it like that. Like I'm not trying to solve like this really big problem of climate change right here. Like I'm just trying to help. Mm -hmm. um, and for them to see like the beautiful part of things are, are gonna be, um, they're not gonna last for a long time. And I think, yeah, like as, as I mentioned earlier when I was talking to like this chemistry um, guy, he really was trying for me to also research about um, how I was getting the other um, ingredients like f to create this textile. So really researching like the whole blueprint that I was um, trying to communicate here. So just from what I was getting the glycerin or what I was getting the spinach. Um, so just giving the, the whole big picture of the process, I think it was pretty important for to me. And um, like right now, I, I, I know in like, for example, in Europe, like biomaterials has been a, like a big thing for a long time, but here in Vancouver is like pretty new and more in Canada. Um, so I think also presenting this as something new and that it might help us in the future, it helped me. And yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. We can go next. Okay. Sure. Um, do you guys have any specific advice for working with other people, like collaboration, having conflicting ideas coming in and different visions, and how you actually work around getting to a final product without, well, obviously there's going to be some conflict along the way, but making that conflict constructive and, yeah, finding your way to that, that finished thing. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's really knowing um, what your problem is that you're solving. If it's very abstract, then there's going to be a lot of opinion <laughs> involved of like, oh, well, mine's right. But if, if you've got a really great problem statement <laughs> that's defined clearly, then... Uh, then, then that will help. The next thing often when I'm designing is I do a requirements matrix. So like what is a must have? Like if, if this requirement doesn't exist, this will not work. You know, it has to have a screen or digital input. And then, and then from that matrix in the middle, it's more nice to have options, but that may make this very innovative. Um, and then there's a really truly like optional, and because you tiered your requirements, there's a lot less debate. <laughs> if your solution doesn't meet X requirement, then they're, they're not on the same level. So you, you need to mitigate those risks early on, 
because obviously conflict in ideas will always happen and um, it isn't he says she said or like you know you could battle out you could but like no I usually start with strong requirement sets yeah that's that's really good um, just having like those concrete down so you know what's what's going on I would just be interested also in working in a smaller studio with a few people how that happens yeah it again it had to evolve um, my my one partner uh, Nick and I we started collaborating in second year of art school and by fourth year we we're every almost everything we made was a collaboration and the, and you know at that time the sculpture de, or the fine arts department we were a bit of a novelty because there were no one else was working that way in in the fine art department not as a regular collaborative team. Um, so we, ha we just had this chemistry right off the bat that, and, and uh, uh, perspectives that, that um, you know, balanced each other well. And then we brought our third partner in, Pam, and then we had to learn how to all three of us work together. And a lot of that was kind of coming to similar conclusions. Like we didn't, we didn't have like a design process in the beginning that, that gave us that foundation and that way to talk to each other, but we eventually arrived at pretty much what you've described. Um, so that really helps. And then I think the biggest thing is just like, for me, I liked being right a lot. I really, I still like being right, but I'm, I'm less into it now than I was. It took me a long time. Um, and so like, what from for me and for all of us is like getting to the point where what you like is a really good outcome and if you're a team if you know if the crucial ingredient comes from your partner it's like that's cool like just set up a, a culture in the in the studio where the best idea can surface and and experiment a lot Thank you. Any other questions? Um, so this is a question for Ermin. So how did you enter the pediatric healthcare industry? Were there like other qualifications or experiences that you needed? Mm -hmm. And another question is like, what exactly do you do? And can you describe like maybe a specific project? Um, yeah, good questions. Um, so I know a lot of healthcare designers. I'm a healthcare designer. You see my portfolio is aerospace, retail, tech. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, so it, it, it wasn't something that I was immediately looking for. Um, I think the opportunity arose where I was with my network. Um, and uh, having my own consultancy, we had consulted for Seattle Children's to help them launch the innovation team. And, um, and so we had exposure and, and, and a good connection to start with. Um, and what is that team? Well, um, you, pediatrics, kids, um, healthcare is a very underlooked, underserved uh, uh, environment. A lot of the big businesses, it's not very profitable to invent for kids, it's very niche. And that doesn't mean that they should get less of a care. A lot of solutions are adult solutions that are adopted for children. And that doesn't lead to great care. In fact, it leads to safety and risk. So uh, the, the, from my understanding, there is not much innovation teams in pediatric healthcare. So maybe we're one of the first. And it, it stems from uh, the what's called the Continuous Improvement Innovation Team at Seattle Children's that was launched to help the the, the hospital uh, or the organization, because seven different organizations, but like um, to, to really be the leaders of pediatric healthcare. In order to do that, you need to do it through improvement and innovation. So build a team on it. Um, what do I do? I'm, I'm, it's a very lean team. Um, I think, I, I, and it's, it's being a problem solver, uh, motivated to see the real problems at the hospital, um, and I think that's a very unique opportunity. A lot of businesses, I was telling Toby, like a lot of businesses stem from te technological innovation, and, and once they have a cool new tech that might solve this, they try to 
you know, jam it into the healthcare system and it may, might make change. But I think what's really super unique is very little do you get designers seeing the real need by nurses, by doctors, by the children, and you start seeing a pattern where there's a huge opportunity to improve this and that there actually is dedicated designers and engineering to go in and solve it. Um, you know, you're, we're at the core of it. And uh, that's why I do is I, I don't think it's a junior position because it requires you to, I'm developing UX, like I'm go, doing digital innovations to physical innovations. It's doing anything and everything um, to, to make some, to build out platforms or ideas. Uh, we are not funded in a way that we can take those innovations straight to market, especially those clearing FDA uh, requirements. Those are five-year long development cycles. They cost millions. But what we are doing is testing and creating these solutions that are making ch changes within the hospital. And hopefully one day we take those learnings and we can have that, we will own that IP and uh, try to sell it or work with partners to then change all of healthcare through that type of like, you know, start small nurturing into bigger, greater uh, platforms or, and, and projects. Um, we're, I don't know how much I can say, but we're looking at projects that are looking at racial biases of products that have been designed that have proven to be racially biased because you have a darker skin tone, and we're looking to solve those problems. So it's really big problems, not just at the children's hospital level. We're, uh, we, I can say this probably, like we work with Microsoft, and uh, they have an inclusive tech lab. You should check this out. Um, Bryce Johnson runs this, and uh, he, I think he, you'll see he has a bunch of talks. Um, he, he was a co-creator of the Microsoft Adaptive Control. Uh, you know, game controls, they're designed for, if you have a left hand and a right hand, and you're very mobile, but not most people, like there's actually a, quite a huge demographic that controls don't work that way. And so there's a whole team at Microsoft figuring out what that future might be, including Logitech, and actually they work together. But we're also working with them to figure out what the future, how do you make um, the future of gaming uh, more accessible to those that just aren't, the typical human, right? Yeah. Any other questions in the back? Thank you. Hi, uh, this is kind of a general panel question. <clears throat> so excuse me. Um, I was wondering, um, for all three of you, what was a very um, pivotal moment in your career or in your uh, design practice, design philosophy that was that um, really boosted your kind of your design practice in general and your like career wise was there any specific event experience or mindset change that like um, prompted such a big change in your personal careers um, yeah for us it was <clears throat> it was very early on I'd say like 2005, um, we just decided that we were going to work as sustainably as possible, which at that time was, you know, is a little harder to understand what that looked like. We knew, we knew the basic things that we needed to do. Right? I think we we basically realized that we were moving into uh, uh, an industry and a sector of the economy that could be. Um, propelled by fashion or trends and we just kind of got grossed out pretty quickly <laughs> and we're like okay how can we make you know good work here um, that we can feel good about and yeah we we landed on on that as like a reason for making what we made and then we turned it into an exhibition <laughs> we um, we one of the first things we did is we partnered with uh, there for there was a, like a little festival in town, uh, sustainability festival in two thousand six and seven, and we pitched to them the idea of having um, a show about uh, sustainability and design, and we brought in thirty 
um, objects from around the globe by designers that were taking different approaches to creating sustainable products at the time. And that show uh, ran in, a, in three different venues over three years. And, and it was like just a great education for us because we were like just trolling the internet looking for people that were making cool things. And now we just email them and we're like, we've got an exhibition <laughs> and we want your piece. And this, these are all our questions, right? So we use the exhibition to, to give ourselves an education. Now you guys are, I mean, this is a big part of your education now, I imagine. Um, it's sort of like taken for granted that we need this is our big responsibility or one of them as designers. But at the time, it was a great uh, reason for us to, to move forward. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think it was my, uh, the biggest moment was my graduate project. Um, you know, I told you like, oh, it would be amazing to get an internship. I knew that at fourth year. I was like, ah, oh, I need to work with a company. So I was very lucky to, uh, because I was trying to constantly network, um, and it was actually through a professor here, Keith Chaplin, uh, he connected me with Teague, who was then my employer, and that was pivotal to me. But that journey to do it was very, it wasn't targeted. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do it. My, my graduate se senior thesis, I wasn't going to design the, redesign the airplane lavatory <laughs> because of Teague. It was just like, oh, that's a shitty problem. <laughs> um, and so I, I focused on that. And just so like my big break was Keith then connected me to Wing Yutani, who was very pivotal at Teague of like building out that aviation studio, who is uh, oftentimes the hiring manager that pulled in designers. And I and through and showing him and with my also partner, uh, like so we had a, a our senior project was two people, two designers working on the same project there from laboratory. Like we because we kept on interfacing with him, um, it led me to the role. But it, again, it was not linear. I, I exited. And I was like, hey, Wayne, do you have a job for me? He's like, nope. <laughs> I was like, ah. So I went to do call center work at Rogers Wireless. It felt pretty hopeless, actually, for a period, because I didn't get a job, and I just didn't feel uh, I was getting any traction. There was Form 3 here, and there was very little studios, so I knew I had to go out. I w just wasn't sure how, and so I actually felt t took the safe way. I applied for my master's in architecture. I was like, screw industrial design. I'm going to do architecture, and um, I had a uh, told Wayne this, I was like, ah, I can't find anything, I'm gonna go to architecture, and he's like, oh wait, <laughs> I think I might gotta get a job for you. And he pulled me in, and it was really funny, my first day at Teague, all, all the managers were surprised, they're like, that's weird, I thought we only hired one person, why is there two Asian guys? <laughs> and, uh, and it was Wayne kind of just, he gave me a big break, he, he got me in, and uh, gave me a chance, and um, yeah, forever thankful for that. Um, for me, I think, um, like, the first year that I participated in the exhibition, I didn't really talk to anyone. <laughs> like, I just put my project there, and I was like, uh, I don't want to, like, continue with it. I was really just burned out from it. Like, it was a lot. But then this year, I was like, okay, I'm going to just talk to them and, like, see what they think about it. And I actually met this... Um, He's a Colombian designer. His name is Juan Socarras. And he was part of like the fashion week this, um, I think it was like two weeks ago. And um, yeah, he was like, oh, Paula, like, just come and like work with me. Like, I think you have like a good eye and you know, like you have experience with sewing. And he just needed like someone here based in Vancouver because he was coming like all the way from Colombia to like showcase his work in the fashion week. Um, so yeah, I think even though I did wanted to like focus more in ceramics other than just like textiles or so, like biomaterials, it was like really great to have this other experience of being in, in the fashion industry. Um, and that's really like pivoting for me to like, okay, maybe ceramics is not the thing that I might want. Um, so yeah, like just just talking to people, it's like you get a lot from it. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Cool. Um, I just want to first off start by saying thank you for you guys for taking your time coming in and um, sharing your insight. And my question is kind of similar to now's. Um, I went to try and take a peek at all of your works, and they're all beautiful. Um, and like after graduation, when you lose the accessibility to like facilities and all that, did you find that you had to kind of like pivot a bit and see like work in different ways through your style and um, yeah, and how comfortable were you with that with that change? Yeah. Should I go? Um, yeah, like the facilities here are really good. Just like having access to the wood shop. Um, but for me, like for ceramics, I know there's a bunch of studio around like Vancouver, but it's kind of expensive. Um, but I, I, there's this, I don't know if you call it a studio, but it's called Mad Lab. Um, and it's like on Hastings Sunrise. And I, you, you either get like a spacer for like your own things, you can pay for the space and then you have access to like, they have wood shop, they have ceramics, they have like a loom for textiles. Um, they have like laser cutters and like just like a mini Emily car, I'll say. <laughs> Because actually, like the person, um, it was three students. I think one of was from Ontario and the other two were from Emily Carr and they like, created this. It's been for like a while, I think. Um, so yeah, I think it's good just to have that space. And for example, like I know some of our classmates, like Nolan and like Luca, like they're creating like their own thing in there. Because um, if you want to get access to like all these machines from the wood shop, of course it's expensive to like purchase them yourself. But if you get like a group, or be like, okay, I have um, the sewing machine and I have like the, I don't know, like laser cut it or like a 3D printing or something, just like getting together as a group. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel guilty. I had it easier than you guys because Vancouver, when I went to Emily Carr, was not ins as insanely as expensive as it is now. So my, my partners and I took up a studio in second year, um, a big, unheated, rambling, cool place that we, you know, a lot of artists and designers came in and out of there. Everyone had a little bit of space, and we had a common shop where we pooled our... We got a shitty table saw, and we, you know, we just started cobbling stuff together, and everything had to come off of those tools in the beginning. Um, so, so it was easier, and I really kind of worry, like a little bit, about that that model is kind of gone for you guys. It sucks, um, but in the meantime, up has have sprung like you know maker labs and and these various uh, ways of, of sharing. Um, and that, that's, you can, you can do that. And you can also just like it, start designing for the suppliers that are out there. There's laser cutters and aqua shears, there are metal fab people and powder coaters and anodizers and like all those people. Are, now again, like when we started 15, 20 years ago, those people didn't want to work with us. They were used to making stuff for fishing boats and, you know, logging extraction. And we go in like we're creating this this light, and it's you know we want you to spin this part, you know. And they're like, what? And you want twenty of them? Like, no, go away. So, but now that's changed because the because people are making things here, and because those extractive industries are dying, if not dead, um, there's a transition of industry towards, but we don't, what we don't have is what they have in Europe, right? Like if you're in Italy, you'd, you could go to the town that like does legs for tables, and then there's the <laughs> town that does, you know, that spins metal, and there's, you know, there, oh God, they've got that, right? But we also have the opportunity here to create that, so you guys could be part of that. Is that the name of the town? Like in translation, legs <laughs> only does legs Leg for town. tables. <laughs> Leg town. Yeah. I, I don't know if my answer is really relevant. At Teague, we're spoiled. Like there's there's an industrial design team, but it's completely supported, and there's um, there's a build team. So in when you design airplanes, you have to 
we build it in full scale. Um, I guess maybe most people don't know that, but like, yeah, and so there's actually full prototyping facilities. So as a designer, like there's actually different pathways, maybe that's relevant, is if you're a really hardcore builder and like creativity is cool, but you rather like figure out how something's built, there actually is another role called a technical designer at Teague where we will envision what the different architectures might be, we'll hand it off, and then we'll have a whole team, two teams, one team that 3D models it um, and builds it and makes it realistic renders, and then another team that will build different mock-ups and figure out how do, you, how do you get this up, like in full scale, and they'll do all the details, and we have an engineering team that does all the engineering of, of it. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, just like, for, like for me, I use a lot of like Rhino and like uh, Moto. So if you want to, I know it's expensive to purchase like a uh, like a license, but it's better to do it as a student because I have the student discount. So for example, for Rhino, I purchased my license, and then I have like this student price for like whole life. So just just buy everything before you are not a student. Yeah. I'll just touch on one last thing, which is uh, like I like how you brought up. Because there, there are people that, you know, everybody has a different interest in design. And, like, those people that are very, like, architectonic and, like, very mechanical, um, the real, like, builders, uh, this might apply less to you. But one thing that, I've, that I found that I kind of actually enjoyed when I was, like, I was taken out of Emily Carr and I, I had a job immediately with a place that had a full wood shop that I could access on the weekends if I needed to. So that was the option. So I kind of was spoiled for that. But since I've been back and since I've left there, um, having nothing is almost, it's a little like freeing because, you know, I have this, I have this interesting idea that I could make in a wood shop in two days if I wanted to, but I'm like, how can I make this with nothing? Or like, how can I make this out of garbage? <laughs> you know? And so, you know, I have like, you have this idea for a chair where you're like, I can whip this up in a wood shop in eight hours, but it's like, Maybe I'll learn how to maybe I'll learn how to like weave willow branches and make it out of that. Maybe I'll learn how to make case in glue. Maybe like there's all of these ways, you know. We haven't had wood shops for, you know, 30 million years, however long we've been alive, and people have figured out ways to do other things. So I think I would say before you go crawling to Maker Labs, just embrace it a little bit. See what you can do and then go to Maker Labs. Yeah, I think we're out of time for questions. We'll wrap it up here. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up, and this will give you all an opportunity if you want to have just one-on-one, -on -one, ask some questions, come say hi. This will give you some. Uh, oh, and make sure that you check in using the QR code so that you can win one of uh, an Opus card, right? Yeah. One. Oh, we've got three Opus cards. You could win one. And we're okay. going to ask a very brief little survey, like three questions about what you thought of the yeah, and just wow, thanks so much. This was great. This was really fun. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks,